Welcome to Discussions of Music, Healing, and Consciousness with your hosts, Chris Noble and Bill Perotsman. In today's episode, we're talking about how music and consciousness are linked together. We'll also attempt to answer the big questions such as, what the heck is consciousness anyway? And how can we tell that consciousness has changed? Chris will share a personal story of how his awareness of trauma shifted as a result of music. And we'll make some spontaneous observations about how to practice the awareness that can happen before a real physical stimulus. We also offer hopeful and supportive examples of real-life consciousness shifts, such as the positive changes around gender fluidity, blending of cultures and ethnicities, and the renewed worldwide interest in psychedelics, spiritual psychology, and freedom. We'll be talking about all that and much, much more, as always, in these open conversations here on Discussions of Music Healing and Consciousness. I think today is a great opportunity to talk about levels of consciousness. And although we talk about consciousness all the time on this podcast, what on earth are we talking about? When yeah, we what talk do I about, really mean? <laughs> you know, the audience, I feel sometimes is like, what the hell are these guys talking about? Consciousness, levels of consciousness. So... Maybe today would be a great opportunity to talk about specifically what is consciousness, what are the levels of consciousness, and then of course at some point we'll relate it all back to music. But yeah, we can. Yeah, you know, Bill here has pulled up. I know this is an audio podcast, but for those of you listening, Bill's pulled up a really nice PDF here by David Hawkins, and uh, he's put together basically a chart on the levels of consciousness. So. Bill, do you want to take us through this? This is oh, I haven't, sure. I've never seen this before uh, for the listeners too, so this is actually really new for me, and I'm excited to learn more. So yeah, I've been th- you know really interested in how people evaluate consciousness for a long time, you know, and we're not talking about like you're, whether you're conscious or subconscious. We're, we're talking about awareness, maybe, but more of consciousness as an ethos, as a way of being, and. The tough part about consciousness is this, there tends to be judgment about it, like some is better than others. And from the standpoint of a musician, that would be like saying, okay, all the low notes, all the notes on the piano below, like middle C, we're going to say are negative. Right. All the notes above middle C are positive, and we're going to try to make music that's all positive, right? And that's like stupid. Doesn't work. <laughs> you need to, all the notes are necessary, mm-hmm. <laughs> Right. And, and I tend to feel like that about consciousness too. I mean, you talk about higher consciousness or higher vibration and okay, that's fine. But for the purposes of this conversation, if you can just kind of suspend your judgment for a little bit, if you're listening to this and pull it up, just look for David Hawkins levels of consciousness. We'll try to make a URL in the YouTube version of this so people can click on it and go there. We'll keep it simple. But so levels of consciousness. Um, David Hawkins is really kind of cool because he's got numerical values for all of the levels that he perceives, and you can get into that. But for now, we just want sort of a guide to tell us, you know, what does consciousness look like? If you put it on a spectrum, what would be one end, what would be the other? And uh, David Hawkins' model is useful. I know there are others. I mean, Maslow's got one. You know, remember Maslow's pyramid? That's kind of levels of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So they're out there. And um, we, we talk about power versus force. There's a book out there called power versus force and, you know, levels of consciousness are involved in a lot of things. So, um, so let's, let's talk about this crazy illustration that he's made. So uh, on the left-hand side are colored blocks, uh, ranging from at the lowest level, the lowest level of consciousness, according to David Hawkins is shame to the highest level of consciousness. So again, according to Hawkins, which is enlightenment. And there are probably other people who like resonate for that, right? Like shame is one kind of an expression that's different from enlightenment by a lot, right? And, and that makes sense. And um, what is brilliant about what Hawkins has done is he's correlated his levels of consciousness to what we experience in real life. So the levels of consciousness that sort of revolve around us being inactive, we're going to a sort of vegetative state, are things like shame, right? And then when you get up to enlightenment, then you experience what David Hawkins calls synchronicity and extraordinary outcomes. So there's definitely some sort of a continuum here on this thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously we'd all like to have extraordinary outcomes. And if you believe what David Hawkins says about consciousness, that's going to take a, a, a transformation of consciousness from shame to enlightenment through a whole lot of steps in between making sense. Oh yeah. 
It's really hard sense. to do this when you know the visual is not something everybody's looking at, but yeah, and I think for everyone listening, it's it's it, it is just um this is something that's been adapted in the more Western scientific model that we're talking about today. But I mean, we as I was just quickly researching before this podcast recording, you know, this goes back to the ancient Vedas, ancient Indian, and of course sure. uh, other many many ancient cultures have talked about levels of consciousness, which is another way of saying levels of awareness or levels of being, like you've been saying. And in this day and age, we also start to talk about uh, vibration, right? As we know with quantum mechanics, everything is in a state of vibration. And then we've also been able to start to distinguish what vibration certain emotions are. Yes. And I'm seeing on this chart with the bottom being shame, then guilt, then apathy, then grief, then fear, et cetera, and then all the way up to peace, joy, enlightenment. Um, I could also see this as a vibration chart where you know, lower vibrational energies like shame, like grief, like fear, and then higher vibrational um, emotions like love, joy, peace. This is like, it looks like the similar kind of chart where you get high vibrations being these peace, love, joy, bliss, all that stuff. And then of course, lower vibrations being this fear and guilt. Like I feel like this chart also speaks to to that. So I'm starting to see already a bit of a correlation between almost a level of vibration slash level of consciousness uh, you know I've got, of interesting. A, I've got a problem with vibration because as a musician higher vibrations are just notes <laughs> yeah it's just higher pitch right it's a higher pitch right it sounds uh higher versus lower pitches which sound lower and um you know talking about this we know that 40 hertz for example is pretty low vibration but 40 hertz is pretty miraculous when you think about what it can do I, right I, so I, I think it's it's because it's correlated like I think that it's, and I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure that it's been measured in an actual frequency way. Like, okay, um, I don't know how familiar you are with solfeggio frequencies. Oh, yeah, love them. Mm -hmm. Right? So those are specific frequencies associated yeah. with very specific emotions yes. or feelings like guilt, fear, and, and you know, et cetera, right? So those are also specific emotions. And it is interesting as you go up higher and higher in frequency, you typically will f you get to these higher states of emotion like bliss or euphoria, and so it does do this ascending thing with the numbers of the frequency. If that makes sense, as you yes, you know what I mean. So I guess maybe that's maybe more what I'm saying with that vibration because I agree. It's it's when you say especially how it's thrown around this day and age with you know what's your vibration? Are you in a good vibration today and bad ones? Like well, what the heck's that mean, right? Um, I think, but I think you're right. Like it's, there are associations with specific frequencies and the higher up you go, it seems that the more positive or higher enlightenment, higher consciousness emotions are higher frequencies. And, and we can see that with solfeggios frequencies too. So I, that's where I'm coming from with that. But I, I'm not, I don't know. Like I still don't know a lot of this yet. <laughs> I'm still learning. I, I, it's, it's an interesting world when you're in both of the musical world with one very specific scientific understanding of vibration and frequency. And the more we used to call it the, the new age world or the world of the spirit, the world of soul, mm -hmm. um, the 5D consciousness, right. where vibration tends to mean something else. I mean, it, it, their, their correlations, I think, are there all the way across. But we're sort of stuck here in this thing of trying to explain spiritual stuff in physical terms. <laughs> and it's hard. Which is, it's like, it's such a good point, Bill. Like, you're trying to describe something non-physical with physical language. You're like, how right. is that supposed to work, you know? So we're just doing so the best we can, you know? Let's take a, um, you know, I like, I like to think of these levels of consciousness in terms of their invitation. Mm. Right? So... If your level of consciousness, not you, but if, if someone is at the level of consciousness of shame or guilt, the invitation there is to rise to a, and I'm using a very pejorative word, but to rise to a different level of consciousness, to change your level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, from guilt and shame, you've got two ways to go. Um, end of life, you know, the end of consciousness, or you can move according to Hawkins' model into apathy or grief or fear. Yep. That's a different direction. I mean, I don't see that Hawkins model allows you to move from shame to enlightenment in one jump. 
you know, it seems Spectrum. like there's, yeah, there's, you have to walk through the pathway, right? The, the journey is the thing here, but even, uh, you know, something like peace still has an invitation built into it to achieve enlightenment. And, you know, beyond enlightenment, there's also the invitation to end of life too, right? Absolutely. This is a very human thing that we're doing here, but um, I don't see anything negative about moving from shame and guilt to apathy. At least according to this model, that's an improvement. Yep. You're moving from inaction to sort of hyperactivity and from hyperactivity to happiness. The further you go from force up to power, right? As you move through the spectrum of consciousness levels that are there. And, um, and, and for me, it makes more difference that there's an invitation than that there's a particular frequency. True. You know, we might decide to associate some scientific number of vibrations with fear and a different number of scientific vibrations that we can measure with desire. And we could say that that's a positive shift from fear to desire. Mm -hmm. And I think we'd all agree that that's so, but it's not so the vibrations come after the fact, like the frequency comes after that. After you've made the jump, you can measure a different frequency, but we can't do it the other way around. We can't just immediately blast the frequency of desire at you and know that you're going to change. You know, it's, it's, you these are ways of following the, following the action, essentially. You have to internally shift. I mean, it comes from within. It's not yeah. uh, an external force that's going to have that. So, I, and, I, and I interrupted you, Bill. So, like, you're, no, 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 you're, let's, you're let's, right let's on. take the audience, you know, through, through all these. I think it's really great to just kind of go from the bottom to the top. And yeah, see, yeah, I think so, too. You know? so, um, so, Maslow divides his sort of spectrum of stuff here uh, between force and power. And the midpoint between force and power is courage. So everything that is an improvement over courage is taking us into power and everything that is a, not an improvement over courage takes us backwards into force. Mm. And in that level of force from the bottom up, which we've started talking about, shame, guilt, apathy, grief, fear are all force-based levels of consciousness that Maslow's or that Hawkins says are what we experience as inaction. We're stuck in those places of fear and grief and apathy and guilt and shame. Mm. And um, that's a good way of sort of looking around and saying, well, what am I experiencing right now? Like, I didn't know what I was feeling at a certain point in my life, but I knew what I was doing. And Hawkins is suggesting that we can look at what you're doing and get an idea of what your consciousness level is based mm. upon that. So in inaction, of course, you're stuck in guilt and grief and apathy and shame and fear and all of that. Uh, the improvement happens when you transform from fear to desire. And in that place where desire starts to take over consciousness, Hawkins also finds anger and pride as the improvements over desire. So we've gone from fear one up to desire, and then from desire, the invitation is to anger. From anger, the invitation is to pride. Isn't that weird? You know what's interesting about that, though, is, is things like, I'm going to use anger as a good example here. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got the things like shame, guilt, apathy, grief, fear being in action, things that really do make you feel um, stifled or make you feel that inaction. Like I, I, you know, if you're feeling really a lot of grief, a lot of fear, a lot of the time you don't get off the couch, right? It's a very inactive really. state, tr quite literally. Then when you get things like anger or desire, you know, anger, especially that's very powerful emotion. And there's a lot more force there and there are a lot more power or you getting to that power at least and although it's still something that, you know, can be associated with a lot of negative outcomes and things like that, you don't want to be in a state of anger all the time. It is energetic. And, it, and, it, and as it says here, it, it leads, leads to a state of hyperactivity. And I can totally see that being, in a sense, an improvement from inaction because inaction is that nothing's happening. It's no action. Yeah. And at least anger is going to move you to do something about it. You know, you can be very angry about the p politics and, and, and use that anger to fuel your voice and get out there. You don't want it to be the only thing leading the charge, but it's a, it's a, it's a movement forward. You can get things going with anger. So I, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I find it interesting that the, you know, the negative quote, negative emotions are all the force based emotions. Mm. Anger's there. Grief is there. Um, yeah. Fear is there. And a lot of their corollaries too. Um, it's interesting to me that, at least in Hawkins' view, a level of consciousness can be indicated either by an attribute 
or by an emotion. Does that make sense? Like anger is definitely an emotion. Desire, though, has a different kind of quality about it. It's so true. That's a good point. And I think that it's, you know, in terms of being able to identify, you know, what is my level of consciousness? It could be a feeling. It could be an attribute. And there's going to be more of those attributes as we go up the, the scale here. But it's not always completely one thing or the other, mm. right? Interesting. Um, I've seen very angry, angry people that are completely immobilized. Sure. And yeah, I mean, you know, they're angry and it's probably a good thing that they're immobilized. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. You know, maybe there's components of fear, grief, anxiety, whatever, or apathy that are holding them back. So they don't express that anger, or maybe there's a higher consciousness that says, okay, I'm going to be angry right now and, and accept that without doing anything, you know, about it until I can let that anger burn off a little and then maybe guide that power into um into a better ex expression i guess Which again this is hard because we're yeah. we're talking you know metaphysically but we have to use physical terms and then it leads you into these other to the power section then we yeah the power move, section move beyond that right the thing i love most about this is that for hawkins the pivotal point is courage i think that's very interesting isn't that cool mm -hmm. so we've we've done everything below courage is force that's all the pride anger desire fear grief apathy guilt and shame and then when it comes to courage, everything changes. And the door is open to happiness and productivity. If you're experiencing that, you know that you're in a different kind of consciousness mm. than if you're inactive. And you know, that, Sorry, but yeah. that, that makes me think you know, of courage. Like That's something that I think that's a bit... It's misunderstood, and I'll say certainly for myself because yeah, me too, I associate man. courage with uh, you know superhero movies or right. something very obvious like you know the war heroes or whatever it is, right? Like something obviously courageous, saving uh, you know family from something or whatever it is. Like it's it's a very dramatic heroic, example, right? Like very very obviously heroic, and we forget that courage is so multifaceted and comes in so many different ways. You know, to to quit. Uh, a job that isn't serving you anymore it takes so much courage. To oh my do. gosh! Yeah, to start a business takes incredible amounts of courage. To start be a parent, even being a parent, my God, does it take a lot of courage? You know, uh, and so on and so forth. There's so many other things that we do on a daily basis that take courage. You know, even just um, putting a you know some con uh, content that you've created on on social media or even things like that takes courage. I mean, there's so many micro actions that we have. That take a lot more courage than we might think and, and to give ourselves credit for that is really important. And then the other interesting thing too is courage comes before neutrality. I find that very, very interesting. You'd think yeah. you think the middle of power and force would be neutrality. That makes sense. But no, it's it's courage. And I and I'm I don't even know why that is, but I'm kind of I'm gonna let myself maybe the answer will come to me as we keep talking about it, because I'm not sure. It's really interesting. I see that that neutrality is the moment before the music starts. Mm. Right? Everything is ready. Everybody knows what they're going to do, you know, the moment the conductor's baton comes down or, or somebody counts us in. Mm. That moment of neutrality, which, by the way, we're talking about these qualities now, these levels of consciousness that are related to happiness and productivity. And from courage on up, it's courage, neutrality willingness and acceptance and mm -hmm. i love that acceptance is under happiness because if you have like you know gratitude is not really here but if you have that attitude of gratitude you are willing to accept what comes your way without judgment and that's such a powerful way to engage happiness i mean i'll give a really quick example example bill like sure. i remember i was at a new year's eve party and we all took a moment before midnight to stop, turn off the DJ music, everything. And we we're just like, okay, um, everyone here, like, let's, we want to send a lot of gratitude, not even send, but just feel the gratitude of 2021. And most people, especially in pop culture, will look at the year 2021 and be like, what a crapshoot of a year. What a terrible year. What a, how many horrible things happened this year and this and that and this and that. And I'm like, it's not that those things didn't happen. But so many amazing, beautiful things did happen. And when we look at just that negative, we're completely excluding all the other aspects. And acceptance, gratitude allows you to look at 
every situation and take it all in rather than just look for the bad or just look for the positive. Because on the flip side, if it's all, you know, butterflies and unicorns and rainbows and it's always, always positive, then you're also missing out on a massive area of improvement and an area to learn, experience, all that stuff, like the, sh the darkness, the shadow, all that's just as important. But when you have acceptance and, and gratitude towards things, man, can you ever just accept situations and it doesn't make you roll over and just take it. You have that courage and you have that, you know, truth to be able to like move through things. But man, it's just such a different perspective. So it makes sense that acceptance is under the happiness and productivity section of this level of consciousness. That's really interesting. But how about this people? It's until you've mastered happiness and productivity and the levels of consciousness associated with it, Hawkins suggests that you're not yet ready for peak performance. So how many times have you been to the gym and you just get pushed, right? And my experience of that is that, yeah, it takes some guts to, to stay on the treadmill or stay with the reps or whatever, but I've never applied the level of consciousness that Hawkins suggests yet in peak performance in the gym. I've applied it at the keyboard in music, but this is really curious to me, and Chris, the thing that is so odd about this is that for the very first time up the levels of consciousness, Hawkins includes the mind. Yeah. It's like the mind has been there as sort of a choice mechanism all the way from shame up to acceptance. But until you get to reason, which is the level of consciousness he associates with peak performance without stress, mm. the brain doesn't engage. Are you getting me with that? Actually, I'm not quite. Hold on. Because if it's reason, you're using reason, which is what? Deduction, logical mind. That's your that's reason. The, the cerebral mind. cortex, right? Sure. That part of the brain that thinks. <laughs> so you're thinking. So this is a level of consciousness that's, is it is it pure thought, though, without all the stresses that throw in other ideas, perhaps? So are you, is it when it's reason, it's like a more very pure reasoning maybe what do you think i'm not quite sure platonic reasoning i mean mm. i i don't know but i i'm guessing that logic is involved there um i would i would imagine that evaluative things are involved there i mean I so far we, we've gotten to a place where we've practicing acceptance willingness and neutrality right and we've gotten courage and those are sort of choices mm. yes i accept yes i'm willing to do this um yes here i am ready at neutral for anything those are kind of yes or no's, but reason implies that you're now going to think it through and actually apply the, the human mind, the brain's ability to what it is that you're doing. Mm. And I think it might be reason in the, in the sense of reason um, from the era we used to call the enlightenment, right? It's, it's the, it's the understanding and processing of all the best information to date and the rejection of all of the crap that doesn't serve us in the pursuit of peak performance without stress. I think that's great. I think it's also because you've gone through all these other things like guilt, shame, grief, fear, desire, anger, pride, and then you get to courage, a bit more neutrality, willingness, acceptance, and then you get to reason. This is because this is you're able to hit a peak performance without stress being a key because you're molding um, the mind and I guess in a sense like the heart or these, these higher, these. Oh yeah. It's been more, gotten hard all the way. So right? we're finally at the, at the so mind. You can now get to a healthier place where the mind can come in and without all those stresses that guilt, that grief, that fear, shame bring to your mind. And when you're feeling those things, it's hard to think clearly, right? So maybe this is really where you're able to very much just use your brain the way it's meant to be used, think clearly, and that's how you're having what you know we call getting in the zone and getting yes. into a peak performance without stress. Exactly. Athletes, musicians, artists, yeah. coders, hackers. Any, any human. When you're in that peak performance place, it's so amazing. It's like when, when the band is really rocking, right? It's just so effortless. Oh, man. That's a really good analogy, actually. It's... This is interesting. I'm learning a lot right now. <laughs> Isn't this cool? And, and you know, we're going to keep on going here because a few more levels of consciousness to go. But that's the only place that Hawkins calls out the mind. 
Very interesting. Right. Every, every other place, the mind is just around as a traffic cop, as a yes, no. Mm -hmm. But above reason, above peak performance without stress, in order, we've got love, joy, peace, and enlightenment. And the experience of these things, Hawkins says, is synchronicity and extraordinary outcomes, which is also something we've experienced you know, on stage, right? Big time. Where everything, the whole room is just like locked into this moment. And, um, and that doesn't take the mind. So here are, we are talking about levels of consciousness. We sometimes associate consciousness with the brain, like the head mm -hmm. brain. Mm -hmm. And yet in only one and really crucial place along this spectrum, does Hawkins call out the brain? The head brain. Everything else is holistic. Well, it makes you wonder what is where where does consciousness come from? Of course, this is a huge question in science, mm -hmm. but we have, especially now, way more evidence to support that consciousness is non-local. Yes. Meaning it does not come from the brain. Where does it come from? That we don't well, we have esoteric and spiritual teachings uh, that give us answers to those things, but we don't have specific scientific answers on where it does come from, but we definitely have science to say we know it doesn't come from the brain because we have uh, all those NDEs, the near-death experiences that yes. have been recorded in extremely um, ideal scientific circumstances, which are, you know, emergency rooms, right? And there's been tens of thousands now documented over the decade, decades and researched by some amazing universities and the the conclusions they come to are like there's there's too many thousands and thousands of people that talk about uh, lots and lots of uh, recall as they say right for mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. life after death and they can be in the same operating room looking down at their body because they've literally gone out of their body and their consciousness is moving around the room and then they come back into the body because they were saved and the surgery was successful or whatever and they're now back to life in their body, and they can recall everything that happened during that surgery when they were, quote-unquote, dead. They had legally died. <laughs> so yes. if consciousness was associated with the brain, it would be impossible and absolutely impossible to have these recollections that were perfect recollections, like no, you know, no accuracy lost. And so the, mor the moral of the story is that, yeah, it's definitely not local, and it's funny that this consciousness levels of consciousness by hawkins is uh kind of confirming that in a, in a bit of a way because they only bring it in once which is the reasoning aspect right exactly and you know i'm glad they bring it in on the side of of power it's it's the step between happiness and productivity and synchronicity and extraordinary outcomes is reason and it's an important step it's really huge and i believe for my own sort of experience of consciousness, that that step of reason is where we separate from 3D consciousness and embrace 5D consciousness. Mm. And I mean, we get along the conversation on what's 3D and what's 5D, but the idea there is that it's, it's more than just what we've come to know and all the stuff we've trusted for a long, long time and what we're told and, you know, the religions of the world and all the wisdom literature and whatever. Um, from what I've been able to tell, Chris, we haven't been in 3D consciousness for very long. Prior to, I think, maybe the Renaissance, our basic MO was 5D consciousness. Then the Renaissance happened, and then the Industrial Revolution, and pretty soon now we're all just about bigger, better, faster, and we've forgotten that the real poor purpose here is like love, joy, peace, and enlightenment. Yeah. But for a long, long time, I mean, thousands of years, people were living from a place that the, the real goal was love, joy, peace, and enlightenment, right? And it goes in cycles, though. You know, from my research with ancient history, I mean, it's a cyclical uh, event, this, this levels of consciousness. And there's even uh, some ancient cultures that, you know, like the Mayans, for example, and um, ancient Indian uh, uh, cultures as well, talk about the cycles of consciousness. And they have the age of the zodiac to represent the cycles of consciousness. And they go for thousands of years. But then within those larger cycles, they have mini cycles. I mean, like it's cycles within cycles within cycles, just as everything in, in physics and, and in science and the universe that we see, it's all the same kind of thing, cycles within cycles. And, um, and it makes sense that there's that we went through the last couple hundred years of, um, you know, experiencing more third dimensional consciousness, which for those listening, another way to look at this is what is 3D? Well, it's our physical material reality, which we now know through science is 99.99% empty space. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Everything we consider 
physical reality is what we call matter. And now we know that matter is 99.99% empty space. So what we're really dealing with is when we're living in the third dimensional consciousness, it's that we are living in what we think is everything, which is the physical world. We think that that is all that exists is, and when we die, it's like blackness, right? It's just dark. It's just nothingness. Um, 5D or five dimensional consciousness is the merging of the physical and the non-physical and then literally living in harmony with both of those and understanding how to tap into both of those, which is where things like psychic abilities, you know, non-physical phenomenon. um, This is where you get interactions with every other possible thing you've ever encountered in the supernatural world in you know, fairy tales and folklore and myth of, of, of beings and spirits and angels and all that other stuff. That's what happens in the fifth dimensional uh, non-material reality. So we're fusing them together to create this, this sort of new, or I guess an old consciousness that's being renewed right now. And um, I guess that's just more of a, another way to explain just for our listeners, if, Sometimes I hear it thrown around a lot, 5D, 3D, and maybe for some of those listening, you might have no clue what that is. So that's, that is a, a different way of looking at um, those types Shorthand, of Shorthand, right? It's just, it's a, like an acronym. 100%. And, it, and it's an accurate one, I think. It's a, it, it works for me and it makes sense. But um, this is very interesting, you know, and when you get to the love, joy, peace, and then of course, enlightenment, these are when synchronicities and extraordinary outcomes happen. And I, I couldn't agree more. When you're in those states of consciousness, I don't think I can think of anything that's been utterly extraordinary in my life that hasn't come from those those states of being, like love, joy, peace. Uh, now Although, that I'm trying to think about it. You know? I'm just going to put in a word for desire because, I mean, when was the last time you were in a bar? Um, a little while ago. <laughs> a little while. I mean, it was last week. We were we hung out with some friends, and uh, I was paying attention to the music for some reason or another. I don't know. I just it's was like you're a musician or something. Yeah, yeah something like I, <laughs> musicians. It's a thing we do, and um, the music of desire was really beautiful in that environment. Mm. The music of love, joy, or peace would probably have not worked so well. You know, when you're saying that, are you saying the, the genre or the feel of the music? Had that desire to it? Or what oh, we had, that? you know, it was kind of an oldies bar. So it was a lot of oldie rock and roll stuff, but there was some hip hop on the jukebox. Um, there's a real good selection. Nice. But they weren't playing, you know, Yanni. <laughs> I get <guess, laughs> or, I what you're saying. So it's, it's you know, yes, yes, yes. I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And, and I had no trouble being in that environment. I don't think anybody else that was there did either. Sort of visiting that level of consciousness for a few hours was nice. I don't see anywhere on this chart either, and, uh, you know, that says, anything is a positive or a negative, you know, enlightenment exactly. versus shame being at the very opposite end of the spectrum is like our emotions is, is anything inherently good or bad? It's not nothing. Nothing is ever good or bad as horrific as any actor thing you can even think of in theory, none of that is bad. We are the ones that place that judgment on it. But the fact is, does the action or the experience is just the action or the experience. It exactly. just is that, you know, it's not inherently good or bad. So I think it's a hundred percent, you know, I love going into a, a fun dive bar and hearing some like heavy rock from like late nineties or early two thousands or something really gets like, go. or some Zeppelin and whatever, like just yeah. some nice, like heavy grungy kind of rock and you're in a dive bar and everything's kind of not the vibe I would love to be around all day, every day, but for a couple hours on a fun little occasion with some friends or something, heck, like, that sounds great. Let's yeah, do it. exactly. It's not the place to sing Ohm. <laughs> not quite, but, no. But you can visit those places too, right? Exactly. And, and the, the, the whole thing about this is, I think, being consciousness, being conscious people, so being aware, the further you go in terms of your education and levels of consciousness, the more choices you have, right? Because you can visit anger or desire when you need to. You can visit fear when you need to and and grief, of course, when you need to. But you're just a visitor. And, you know, you don't really have your home in any one place. You're just aware of the way that the music is flowing through you, right? The the Mm. music of consciousness is flowing through you. And when you do that with acceptance, it, it's so much easier because I resisted all that. I mean, Chris, for a lot of my life, I resisted. Mm, me too. And um, 
you know, I, I had to do that to learn what I learned. I, I was about to say, and I'm sorry I did, but I'm not sorry. You know, I you need to experience that. I had to do that, and I, maybe we all have to do that it's in some way, right? To get to wherever it is that we're headed, and to learn. Um, like we're here to learn. You know, a lot of our life is really based off of just learning through experience, and yeah, that's how we that's how we learn best is going through challenging situations and and having pain and suffering. Suffering is extremely important. You know, uh, I was being educated more recently on the story of the Buddha. You know, and how he oh, came yeah. from extreme wealth, and for him to actually go through his spiritual awakening and and to learn everything he was able to learn to then of course teach and have such a positive impact on so many lives. Um, he seeked suffering. He knew that suffering was extremely important to be able to understand the full spectrum of life. And that's the same thing I'm seeing here on the levels of consciousness. It's a full spectrum. You got, it looks like every color um, on the, right. the, the rainbow is on here too, right? Like it's literally yeah. a full spectrum. And that's what I, life's I all about, you know? I often wonder about correlations between color and sound and consciousness and all the rest of that it's like i think it is all synesthesia you know like that's another episode we could even talk about all that stuff like seeing shapes and sounds or uh, colors associated with music or tasting things when hearing certain music or vice versa i hear music sometimes when i taste something delicious you know like it's it's so they're all connected they're all connected it's all connected i i'm um i'm of the mind which this isn't new so i want to give credit where credit is due Uh, istak bentoff wrote a book in the seventies, I think about all of this stuff. And it's been a great influence on me because if you take vibrational theory, you eventually get to a place where the universe looks like a giant donut that's sort of revolving in on itself. Mm. It's like a giant spinning Taurus. Yeah. And the closer one is to the center of it is a difference than to where one is on the external side of it. Right. So it's like, if you can imagine a big bang and then it's just, going to go out and come back in in like a circular form. That's kind of what you were talking about with the, the awareness that we've had through civilizations, right? Civilizations come, they get, they, they rise, they do this thing. And for some reason, then they collapse and they rise again, like Rome yeah. takes over the world. Then Rome collapses. Then mm-hmm. some Constantine comes along, right? Do I have my history, right? And um, maybe it's backwards. And, you know, it's, it's like these cyclical things. And I often wonder in these levels of consciousness, which we see in very two-dimensional forms, like what happens after enlightenment? Do you <laughs> disappear and then come back in in a, in a new form and start over and begin the process again of, of learning it? And uh, Bentov suggests that, yes, we do. But on a, on a macro level, like on a universe level, the universe, boom, it expands. And then eventually it collapses again. And then it starts over, boom, it expands. And I heard the, another analogy. It's the, it's also the universe is just breathing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, right? It's the lungs breathing in, and breathing out, and breathing Is it in, the Hindus that have the image? Um, Brahman opens his eyes, the universe comes into being, closes his eyes, the universe disappears. Yeah, right? yeah. Like that. And um, I think that the wisdom teachers are right about this, that there's some sort of an aspect of breath, and that it's not just about achieving enlightenment, but it's about the cycle of achieving enlightenment and achieving enlightenment. And achieving enlightenment, right? And it's the joy of the journey, as we like to it's say. It's the joy of the journey because I think they say too, like if you're trying to achieve enlightenment, you'll never achieve it, right? Because that's in of itself, uh, you know, part of being enlightened is to let go of any um, accolades or accomplishments or goals or objectives. Those are just don't matter at the end of the day. Existence yes. is pure existence, and I think maybe what happens when you get to that stage of enlightenment is you. You have no need to come back into a human body or you become a different level of being and then can transcend and maybe become those like, I don't know, interdimensional beings or some yeah. angel yeah. or some, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, right? Part of the 99% of stuff we don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure, exactly. <laughs> Just go into that area because uh, my other friend too, like I was looking at the the visible light spectrum and we see 1% of what's actually out there. I know, I feel Quite ripped literally. off, man. Like... What kind of eyeballs do? We? <laughs> like, right. What the heck? I mean, we're just we and basically and everything. If we could actually perceive it right, it would be upside down from what we see. <laughs> I know, I know. Like everything is upside down. It gets somehow turned around in our eyes, our brains, or whatever, and then our minds create this virtual reality for ourselves, and uh, and then that's what we go and we call that reality. 
and uh, and and it's funny that we we can get really bottlenosed or really sort of get tunnel vision on and and, and with a bit of um, you know, with a bit of pride uh, that might get in the way or a bit of uh, egotistical nature with the human race, because we, we really do sometimes think we got it all figured out. And well, I, don't you know, we do. <laughs> right. It's of all course. done. They figured it's, it all it's out. It's all done. Yeah. There's literally <laughs> nothing else left to figure out. And I always laugh at that. And especially like I hear scientists say that too. Like, well, we've, we pretty much figured out like how the, you know, the, how the universe or how our solar system works, how planets work, how the sun. And then, a week later or a day later, something comes out and completely throws all their calculations out the window because we discovered something new that changes our paradigm, et cetera, et cetera. And like, come on, guys, <laughs> like, we, we can't see more than 1% of what's actually out there in this reality, yet we think we know what's going on. We can't see. Like, come on. Like, that's crazy. That's absolutely, we barely hear it. We can't probably smell it at all. Our five senses don't do much to get yeah. us, you know. We're pretty exactly. lame, actually, when it comes to pretty lame. <laughs> perceiving things Quite well. Literally, <laughs> like we, we, we have a bit of a handicap here. Where... And, well, you know, and then you talk, so we all know about color and the rainbow and that whole thing, right? We did the crystal prism in, in school. And then you talk to an artist. And when they're mixing colors, it's all backwards from what we thought we knew. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, we blend like yellow and blue and we expect to get green and the artist who's painting a painting will tell you something completely different mm -hmm. about that and you know I, I as a lame painter myself i've tried that and all i can get is brown but there are other ways of mixing color that actually result in really beautiful things that are not based on you know the average joe's perception of what color is because there's a million ways to do the same thing i think uh, um, yeah right you know why why not and, uh, uh, and and who's to say, right? What? Well, I mean, some of us can say the scientists can say with some level of certainty certain things, but they also are very quick to caveat that and say, as far as we know, <laughs> because it's important. I think I think the the, the really good scientists are the ones that know that all of the things they're saying could quite literally be completely false a hundred years from now or exactly. Less. I think David Hawkins would be one of the first people to say. You know, as far as I know, <laughs> as far and that's like everything we 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 are hinged on with in, in terms of our reality and what we think is real is just an idea. It's a it's a hypothesis. It's a theory. Some theories that have got maybe a lot more credibility to them, but even still, like I mean, so many times in in history, we've oh my god, we were certain that the Earth was the center of the universe. We were absolutely certain that everything revolved around us and. People like Galileo, not that different in this day and age when other people speak out, you know. That heretic. Um, right? <laughs> like Galileo, under house arrest and never was able to do anything ever again, completely had his career basically ruined. He's lucky that he wasn't murdered. And he just got house arrest for the rest of his entire life. What did he do wrong? He just said something that completely changed the paradigm. And there's no different today. You know, I even see in like alternative history sides of things where – you get certain, you know, professors like a friend of mine, Dr. Robert Schock. He um, is famous for redating the Great Sphinx in Egypt back in the 90s, and he's using geology to do this. But you're going against, oh, God, 100, 150 years of um, old, very old colonial Egyptology. And because you're turning around that paradigm and you're, you're making all these basic Egyptologists have to rewrite all of their textbooks by doing this, not very popular and still to this day he struggles with getting any academics to listen to him but how long did it take galileo to have his theories like brought into practice about a hundred yeah. freaking years yeah so you know it's no different in this day and age all the people that are pioneers in a lot of their different sciences whether it's medical whether it's history whether whatever um they're always going against the grain and those are the real heroes that take a lot of this, this courage that we've been talking about because they're coming out and, they, and then there's, it's very rare that they'll ever get recognition in their lifetime, you know, because we, we have this ability to, we, we don't like change. I find people get a nah, little, it's scary. It's, it's scary. And, and I get that to a degree, but I think we can also get to a place where with acceptance, you can be a lot more susceptible to um, positive change in a sense of, just being okay with knowing that, look, the only thing we can guarantee in this crazy world is that nothing stays the same. <laughs> Change happens inevitably all the time. 
sorry, not sorry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, we have some encouragement. I, I've, um, I'm relatively new to the study of consciousness, but I read an article last week about one of the upcoming sort of Galileo names in another hundred years. He's going to be on the top of the list right there with Jung and, mm -hmm. and Freud, a guy named Stanislav Grof. Yeah. who was doing a lot of experiments with, he's a psychologist, he was doing a lot of experiments with psychedelics before they were outlawed. And he developed a, a type of psychotherapy that includes, to, to keep it very simple, spirituality. So in Groff's understanding, psychology extends into the spiritual. Makes sense to me. And based on the you know, studies of LSD and psilocybin and all the other stuff he was able to, to actually work with and thousands and thousands of patients and actually doing clinical tests with patients and LSD and stuff like that, um, his psychology embraces the spiritual. I think we're going to hear a lot more about that as we go down this psychedelic road, but also as the world begins to shift and curiosity about 5D consciousness becomes more mainstream. Uh, the work of Groff and probably others is going to become more valuable to us as we leave the sort of, um, and I hate to say this because psychedelics are an evolution over psycho, uh, what do we call them? Uh, psychoactives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the medicines that have taken us this far, Prozac and uh, what lot of involves or whatever. Yeah. yeah. All the pharmaceuticals that have gotten us here, the black box stuff. Um, we're evolving out of that now and mm -hmm. evolving more in the direction of whole plant medicines we're evolving out of the limits of the psyche to be more about the idea of consciousness that is open to spiritual things, love, joy, peace, enlightenment, that kind of stuff. And we've already got somebody who's paved the way, right? So we can follow these things. We can follow Hawkins. We can follow Groff. Um, that'll help us get there much more easily, I think, than if we were, you know, to mention somebody whose name is now in disrepute, but Columbus setting off from Spain and hoping hope of finding the gold in the new world. I think we've got a better shot than he did. <laughs> and, you know, in terms of like being able to ride this consciousness road. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, I completely agree. We're in a really exciting time. I mean, the fact that, um, you know, you invited me to one of your mastermind conversations. I've been telling a lot of people about this and uh, here I am, you know, Bill invited me to speak at one of his masterminds and I'm speaking to uh, a whole uh, bunch of people that are, what was the demographic age wise? I'd say roughly 60 to 70, roughly. Was that maybe something in that ballpark? Yeah, roughly? That's right. We're looking at age wise and this is the, in my judgmental uh, mind, I would say would be the last demographic I would expect to be curious about psychedelics right? and psychedelic healing and, and all that kind of stuff. And here I was sharing my experiences uh, with psychedelics and my healing journey and enlightenment journey with psychedelics with these wonderful people. And so, so much interest, so much general, general curiosity. And I can only imagine that that is because we're also at a time where it is a lot more socially acceptable to talk about this stuff, to talk about it seriously, to talk about it as a serious form of therapy and medicine. And uh, it's not just a party drug anymore where you just talk about how tripped out you were and how crazy crap you're seeing. Um, it's really not about that anymore. It's about using it for what it's meant for. And um, yeah. man, are we in for a, a real treat? And I, and I believe a true renaissance in mental health and health in general that we're um, certainly going to be probably combating a little bit with other forces like big pharma because they stand to lose a lot of profits here. But um, I just think the collective consciousness is, is, is way too ready for it now. And it's going to be uh, too much inertia, too much um, momentum going in this direction. Thank God. And yes. I think we're going to see a, yes. an incredible shift, even uh, with all the craziness going on right now, it couldn't have come at a better time to have this uh, revelation. So I'm, I'm excited. Well said. I, I completely agree, of course. Because, because <laughs> we're on the same page here. It's like and that's why we do a podcast. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, I love that you mentioned the demographic too. When cannabis was trying to be legal, and you could still get it in California with a medical card, like if you had a medical need for it. Mm -hmm. um, I have some friends who live in a retirement community, and it's not just a retirement community. It's like a retirement community of forty thousand people. It's oh wow, a city in Southern California that is that exists for people who are retired That's awesome. and they have clubs obviously because people who are retired want to get together and do things. And mm -hmm. there was an explosion of cannabis clubs. Wow. Explosion. 
because, you know, older people want to be able to deal somewhat elegantly with pain. They don't want to be, you know, put down by it. And they were very curious how this inexpensive form of medicine, whole plant medicine could help. And uh, so I see the demographic is, is there. And hey, maybe it's, maybe it's older people are going to pull us forward this time instead of the young rebels, because sure. it's older people that have said, you know, I've had enough of these black box medications now. I want something that's well, Because they're, they're probably the ones taking the most of them too, Exactly, right? So, right? I mean, that, that makes so much sense to so, me. Bring it on. You know, older people, help us, help us please move toward enlightenment, right? Absolutely. Hey, you know, you're still our elders and the, our elders, we're coming back to a place where we actually really respect and honor our, our, our elders to to carry us forward and and just like you know the the youth i have so much uh not only faith but um excitement and, and a lot of joy watching all the the youthful generation and how wise they are too and the different forms of wisdom they bring seriously and wise man more wise than i've wise. ever i could have you know experienced i literally <laughs> the other day it was a little while ago i remember walking by a playground i i'm in an, a an area where there's like three schools and a one block radius basically so there's lots and lots of families a lot of kids and um i was walking by and i heard this i saw this one kid he had a cast on and his other buddy was like hey how long you know for the cast i'd say their age is like seven or eight years old roughly and this kid's wearing a cast and his buddy's like yeah so you know how much longer are you going to be wearing that and it's like, oh, you know, uh, I think I got a couple more weeks left. And then the other kid was like, are you suffering from, um, <laughs> it was like, dep any form of depression during your injury? <laughs> <laughs> There's like, there like seven or eight year old kids. They're talking about like, are you experiencing any form of depression? Like, because if you are, you know, that's, that's perfectly okay. And like mm. the language, the, and, I, and I'm barely, Love like it. I'm paraphrasing almost exactly how they were speaking to each other too. And I was just... I had to do a, like a quadruple take and be like, who, who's talking here? Like, how old are these kids? And obviously that doesn't matter because they're wise as all, like, as wise as yeah. elder I could have ever talked to. I was just blown away. I, I can't believe, like, the consciousness in the, 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 the young generation. It's just, it's very exciting. I mean, it's. What a beautiful prophets, thing. Prophets, you know, these little like, mini Buddhas, you know. <laughs> Which is good because these are the people that are going to be in leadership, you know, in 20 years. Oh, it's it's very reassuring. I'll tell you that. Anytime, actually, I feel a little, uh, you know, dismayed at the world, which, you know, is easy enough uh, if you just open up your phone these days. But uh, I just look at the kids and how, how incredible they are. And even, even going through what they're going through right now with all the COVID stuff and, you know, um, they are so resilient. They're so brilliant and uh, they're yeah. so kind and loving and compassionate too. Like, holy cow, their hearts are huge and very exciting times. And I agree though, at the same time, our, our elders have a big role to play. And I think they're, um, they're oddly very open-minded. I find when you get to like the retirement demographic, all of a sudden there's way those preconceived notions are really kind of gone out the window and they're very, very open. Like I have these hilariously open conversations sometimes with my grandmother where I can almost go into more of cool. like an honest conversation than I could with my parents' demographic or their generation almost. It's it's very uh very freeing. I, I find it really fun. I, I I love the side of freedom. Let's continue to do that. If it feels free, I think that's a good indication that consciousness is is changing. It's an invitation to to follow that thread, right? See where mm -hmm. that level of consciousness takes you. Which is, you know, largely I guess what it's all about, because you can't force this. No. And as they, a lot of those ancient wisdoms say, don't force, you know, the, the Tao, the Tao Te Ching, the way of life is to not force things. You know, you, if you think about life as this big river, what's the, what, what way do you want to go about it? Do you want to fight upstream against the current, trying to get to some unknown destination or just let the current take you and maybe take a little inflatable rubber ducky and Right. <laughs> Maybe a surfboard and really Jump make it a fun, a fun go of it, you know? <laughs> I've, I've been reminded of these things so much throughout my life, from, you know, early religion and stuff. But Joe Campbell came along and kind of reminded me that, you know, it's bigger than God is bigger than any one religion. Mm. And um, Siddhartha came along. I don't know if you've read, the, uh, if that was your introduction to Buddha, but Herman Hess wrote this great book called Siddhartha, and it's about Buddha's growing, you know, his, how he became Buddha. Mm. And uh, yeah, gosh, another another Herman Hess is Steppenwolf, which is an allegory for personal transformation. Fantastic enlightenment um, in that 
sort of Germanic era where Jung and Freud were new. So uh, great stuff all the way along. And then right up till today when The Secret came out, that crazy movie, That's right. not many years ago, and The Law of Attraction and Abraham Hicks and the, the teachers that are out there doing this stuff. And then, of course, you hear about folks like Thich Nhat Hanh and um, Eckhart Tolle. Yeah. There's great work going on out there. Oh, yeah. That's it, that people are like resonating for and want to consume. And that's just so heartening when you think about the big picture of where we are in the world. You know, it's politics tends to take the center stage. But if you don't look at that, you find quickly that there's a lot that's going on that's really amazing. So much more going on that's really amazing. So politics much more. Are, politics are the loudest and have a lot of funding to be the loudest, but they are not the only thing and they're certainly they're also the, the smallest important. in number <laughs> they really are it's the <laughs> it's very just loud ironic. loud small uh, noisy little people yeah <laughs> <laughs> if we give them charge. some plant medicine we'll see what happens dude i know that's what they're all worried about that was what nixon was worried about when it you know in the 70s it's like, oh, we can't have people thinking of themselves <laughs> oh no god forbid but, uh, we have a spiritual awakening not on my happening. watch <laughs> it's happening whether they like it and the war on drugs can't do anything anymore so we're no we're good we're good. Thank you for listening in on our conversation and for taking time to show your appreciation with a like, share, or subscribe. Discussions of music, healing, and consciousness is a practice of spontaneity, and we welcome your comments, ideas, and questions. There are ways to connect with us in the show notes, so let us hear from you. Until next time, this is Bill Protzman along with Chris Noble wishing you great musical health. Samara Huchaya. Huchaya.